Again, I am a senior portfolio manager with City National. Um, we partner uh, exclusively with independent advisors like James, like Steve, uh, like Luke, and, and the rest of the team uh, to, to design and implement investment strategies that are customized for high net worth individuals. And so part of the customization uh, is learning about each client, uh, their specific objectives, their not only uh, return objectives, risk objectives as well. And based upon that information, uh, we make certain adjustments to the strategy over time, which is our active approach. Uh, and that approach is, ba is based upon uh, economic conditions, not only current conditions, but also where we believe things are heading in the future. So it's a good way to start the conversation. I'll spend a few minutes talking about State of the Union, the economy, uh, what we think will happen with both equity and bond markets in 2023. And we'll talk broadly about uh, positioning of client portfolios. Again, some of you may not have portfolios with us, but we can at least share our best thoughts and, and positioning at the time. So let me start with, with the economy. In terms of the economy, things have changed dramatically over the last 12 months. So, you know, in, in all honesty, 12 months ago, we had a quite you know, optimistic outlook for the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, we were coming off of just a monster year in 2021. And it was not only a very strong year for the stock market, but it was also an extremely strong uh, environment for economic conditions, corporate profit growth, uh, overall uh, net wealth for households. Everything was where you'd want it to be to expect another year of economic growth and expansion. Um, that changed you know, fairly quickly in 2022. Part of that change is a reflection of the escalation of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, the China COVID lockdowns, uh, that created a little bit more uh, supply chain pressures than what we originally thought would be the case, uh, as well as the Fed. And what it did is it adjusted right the Fed's policy. And the Fed went from being ultra accommodative with its monetary policy, where interest rates were virtually zero, to a much more restrictive path. Uh, and the purpose of raising interest rates was to begin to fight this inflationary pressure. Now, we know all the stories about the Fed and how they didn't, you know, didn't believe in inflation. They weren't concerned of inflation. They thought it was transitory, which was the overused word that you know, they spent a lot of time uh, ingraining in our minds. But they were right and wrong to some extent, right? They were right about the fact that the inflation that we were seeing right, in 21 and, and you know, even part of the early 22 was goods inflation, right? The inflation that was coming from huge amounts of money supply that was created by the government during the pandemic pushed into uh, transfer payments to households. There was supply chain disruptions. And when you have this combination of lots of money chasing very few goods, you get this price inflation right on the good side which is not an inflation that the Fed was concerned about. They fed that, felt that over time, those situations would improve, the imbalances would improve, supply chains would improve. Now, they have begun to improve probably slower than the Fed would have originally hoped, but that wasn't a concern for the Fed, right? The Fed began to get concerned when they started to look at the other aspect of, of the imbalance in the economy, which was labor. And James was sort of alluding to this at the at you know the the initial uh, ongoing of this this webinar, which is uh, the this imbalance that was created during the pandemic just simply means that there is way too much demand for labor and not enough supply of it. Think of labor as no different than any other commodity, and when there is that imbalance, there is going to be pressure. So why do we have that wage pressure? Why do we have that imbalance? Well, a lot of it has you know come from the pandemic. Right, there were a lot of people that were of working age that have taken early retirement. There are a lot of parents that have dropped out of the labor force because of childcare issues. Um, that has not changed. Now we're dealing with an opioid opioid crisis, excuse me, which you know keeps people unemployable. We have a disability crisis keeping people out of the workforce. So there's all these different elements, and believe me, there are more than just those as well uh, that are keeping the labor supply very very light. Uh, at the same time companies were incentivized to expand and hire coming out of the pandemic, whether it was PPP loans, whether it was cheap borrowing costs, right? And that's exactly what happened. 
right? They took that money, they expanded, they took on new projects, they hired workers if they could find them, they knew it was a challenge to begin with. And with all of that hiring, with limited supply, you create this enormous imbalance in the labor market. And when you have that imbalance, right, uh, the dynamics shift, right? They shift from uh, the leverage being with employers, right, to the leverage being with workers. You look at the imbalance, right? There's roughly 11 million job openings that are still posted today, right? There's about 6 million people that are actually looking for a job uh, or considered unemployed, right? A 5 million person gap there, it's huge. And workers notice that, right? They hear about it, they read about it. And so the leverage has shifted to them. And of course, they use that to their advantage, right? We know all the stories about workers going to their employees, threatening to employers, threatening to leave, right? It's led to this great resignation that we've seen. A lot of people have left their jobs for higher paying jobs. Uh, those that have kept their jobs have been retained at much higher salaries. It's a pretty simple, right, threat hey, pay me more, or I'm going to take one of these 11 million jobs that are outstanding. And that's exactly what happened, right? But to offset the impact that wages are having on overall net income, companies simply took that, raised their prices to offset the cost of labor and passed it right back on, right, to households. Well, of course, households are their workforce, if you think about it. So what happens at that point in time? Their workers come right back to them and say, I get it, you gave me a, a raise, right? But all my living expenses have just gone up again. So pay me more or I'm going to take one of these 11 million jobs, right? Same thing happens, right? The wage goes up and then companies simply raise their prices again to offset, right, the cost of labor. That process continues without an end to it, right? It doesn't end organically. Something has to cause it to end. That's what the Fed is intending to do with monetary policy. So why they're fighting inflation now and in through 2022 when they weren't concerned about it in 21 is because inflation has shifted from goods to core services. Core services are dominated by wages because services are very labor intensive. So that's the biggest concern that the Fed has. So how do they fight that by raising rates? Well, think about it. Higher borrowing costs begins to disincentivize right, companies from hiring and expanding. So some of those job postings will come off the table, right? That makes total sense. Uh, they're also going to be limited in terms of how much more they can raise prices, right, to offset the cost of wages and pass that through the households because households are dealing with not only higher debt, but higher debt payments. Remember, every interest rate has gone up. Right? whether it's a mortgage rate, whether it's an auto lending rate, whether, whether it's a credit card rate. So the servicing the debt has gotten more expensive. The overall debt is higher, right? And price increases are still coming. Something has to give. So at some point in time, households say, I can't do it anymore, right? I cannot absorb another price increase for this specific good or service. And therefore I'm going to stop spending, right? And that's what the Fed wants to happen. They want interest rates high enough. So if people choose not to spend, they can save that money and earn, right? That's extremely important, right? It incentivizes people not to spend and actually save. Uh, at the same time, you start to see net profits for companies begin to decline because revenues or sales will decline if consumers aren't spending, or if they are spending, but they can't absorb the higher price increase, then those price increases stop. Right? And companies have to absorb the wage pressure without raising prices, and that will also hit net profits. Either way, the expectation is that corporate profits are in decline, right? And when they are in decline, that is where you start to see companies begin to cut costs, right? And cutting costs happens in different tranches. Um, last year, meaning 2022, we heard a lot about advertising, marketing being, you know, cut from from corporate budgets. Um, and that's the usually the first tranche. Second tranche, we just heard about in this first quarter coming off of fourth quarter earnings reports, which is capital expenditures, right? That's going to decline for a while. The third tranche, uh, which corporations don't want to do, is headcount reduction, right? They don't want to do it because they know all the issues they've had about finding labor to begin with. 
right? But if things get bad enough and profits and margins get squeezed enough, that's exactly what will happen, right? You will start to see a reduction in headcount. And you are seeing it from some of the big tech companies out there, companies that have probably overhired during the pandemic. They were hoarding right, labor when they could find it. Excuse me. Um, but small businesses are still hiring and small businesses make up 90% of all new hires. So the Fed has not achieved its goal yet of convincing right, corporations to begin to reduce headcount. So why is that all important? Again, if it's, it's expensive to borrow and profits are declining, number one, again, the overall um, you know, job openings will decline, household uh, or, or overall um, uh, labor market will start to, to uh, shrink as well. So you start to see this imbalance, right, between headcount reduction and openings decline, begin to start to match the actual demand for labor. And when that happens, wage pressure comes down and inflation comes down, right? That's the Fed's goal. But what it also will end up doing, unfortunately, um, is it will reduce household income, right? People will lose their job. And as people lose their job and income declines, spending declines. And when spending declines in the US economy, that typically leads to recession. So our outlook has gone from very optimistic to somewhat pessimistic uh, in the course of 12 months. We, in fact, do believe that the US economy is heading into a recession. That is our base case scenario. We think it happens sometime later this year because again, right now, the consumer has remained extremely resilient, right? They're still spending, they're still getting hired, they still have the leverage to get higher wages, but savings rates are beginning to get depleted. Uh, again, debt burdens are beginning to rise. Uh, over time, people will lose a job. The good news is that that job loss shouldn't be in the 20 and 30 million like we tend to see in more deep-rooted recessions. Uh, it should be one to two million, right? One to two million jobs, which is about a 1% increase in the unemployment rate. Remember, the unemployment rate is at three fours at a 53 year low. Uh, if it goes up by 1%, obviously, it's, you know, no, we never want to see people lose their jobs, but it wouldn't destroy the economy per se. It wouldn't create a deep recession, but probably a mild recession. So, what we are calling this is a profit driven recession, right? The, the corporate profits will decline enough. That companies will start cutting costs, household income will decline, we will find ourselves in a recession. The good news is that those recessions tend to be more mild than credit-driven recessions, which we're most accustomed to, right? Because that was the last two recessions that we've been involved with. The pandemic and the global financial crisis both came from credit issues. Credit froze, banks stopped lending. Uh, and when that happens, every company, every household that depends on those loans begins to default, begins to file bankruptcy. You see lots of destroyed wealth and profits and high unemployment, low spending, deep recession. That is not what we're expecting under this scenario. And in fact, although bank lending standards have tightened slightly recently, they're still pretty happy to lend at these rates. Remember, if you look at the, the interest that you're earning on your deposits in ba at banks, it's still very, very low. Uh, and yet they're taking that money and lending it out to small businesses for 10 or 11 percent, uh, which is a variable rate. So that net interest margin continues to widen. If you want a loan, you pretty much can get it. But the problem is you're paying a pretty high rate for it right now. Um, so that is a, you know, a positive thing in terms of what type of recession we're expecting. Of course, you know, it, it's there. Everything happens with a lag effect. So the policy that the Fed is implementing, the tight monetary policy, has not yet had the effect that they would expect because the economy is still too strong and resilient. That over time will fade. We do think, again, by the end of this year, the U.S. economy will, in fact, be in a mild recession. Um, in terms of the, the market's reaction to this, right, it's been a bit surprising, I guess we could say, uh, so far what we've seen uh, year to date, at least through January anyway. Uh, which is the markets have completely disconnected uh, from the Fed's messaging. And I guess rightfully so, right? So when the, when the markets, meaning traders, typically, you know, they look at the Fed's historical actions. And what they've noticed is that historically, every time there are cracks in the U.S. economy, the Fed changes course, right? It pivots. It goes from raising rates or having higher rates to cutting rates, becoming more accommodative. They expect that to happen again. And of course, lower rates, 
right, means lower U.S. dollar, which supports earnings and it supports the stock market. Uh, we've seen that over the last decade and change when interest rates were at zero. Um, but the Fed disagrees with that, right? And they've been very clear about the fact that they're not going to pivot because, yes, while inflation may be coming down from the peak, it's nowhere near their target of 2%. And assuming that it won't get there too quickly because of policy lapse, right, they're going to continue to raise rates over the next couple of quarters, uh, maintain higher rates through this year, or at least until the inflation number really does begin to approach 2%. So why this is an issue is it creates volatility. And as investors, we hate volatility. Um, and so on one end, you have you know the markets expecting a Fed pivot. Uh, on the other end, the Fed is saying, no, 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 we're going to continue to tighten. And one of those two right, have to capitulate to the other if, it if in our view, right, most likely scenario is that the markets will give in to the Fed, not vice versa. And we've seen that multiple times right, over the last 12 months. Right? October and November were a rally in the markets. Same thing on the idea the Fed would pivot. December gave it back. Right? Then we had the July rally, right? really strong rally in July, gave it back in September. Right? We had the May rally, gave it back in June. We had the March rally, gave it back in April. Right? That's because there's speculation about what the Fed may do. And in reality, the Fed has a very, very different message. So we do believe the Fed will induce this recession. Um, and in this recession, right, the biggest concern that we have for the markets is not only are they dis disconnected from this message, although they are starting to connect a little bit more over the last two, two weeks, but the earnings, right, the earnings expectations are too high going into a recession. When, when the economy is growing at a slow pace, right, earnings, right, for corporations tend to be positive. Even, you know, they may not be double digit growth, but it could be low single digits. When we head into a recession, right, earnings tend to turn negative, right, a contraction in earnings growth. Um, that is not quite being priced into the market at this point in time. And so as investors, we have to think about what is the multiple we are willing to pay for earnings, right? Well, it depends on a lot of things. Will those earnings grow? Our expectations are no, right? What's the alternative that we have to owning stocks? Well, historically, it's been nothing because bonds were so unproductive. But now with the yields at around 5%, bonds have become a new attractive asset class. So higher yields, right, lower earnings would suggest investors would be willing to pay a lower multiple for stocks in the future. And if that begins to price in, right, we can expect another leg down in the market. How deep? Hopefully, you know, no lower than what we saw in the October lows. It may not even get to that point, but it's certainly a possibility. Uh, and so we have to be prepared in terms of the positioning for that volatility for a period of time until at least the Fed stops raising rates, at which time the markets then can then price in the correct terminal value and can actually start forward looking into 2024. And 2024 looks to be a much more attractive environment, right, for stocks than 2023. Number one, earnings should improve compared to 23. And the Fed at that point in time will have probably achieved its goal, right? And we'll start talking about and most likely actually beginning to cut rates back to neutral. Um, both, again, very attractive for, uh, you know, the stock market. So it's almost like you have to position a little bit more defensively right now for the upcoming volatility over the next few months, but also make sure that we have enough invested to participate in these swings and this sustainable rally if and when it happens. And of course, when it's all said and done, we could be completely wrong, right? It's very possible. Uh, and if we're wrong and the Fed does cut rates this year or the market, or excuse me, the economy does escape recession and it's a soft landing. Um, markets are going to rally on that information, right? We still want to make sure we participate. So we have to be a little bit careful not to take too many chips off the table, just position more defensively. So what does that mean? It means owning high quality companies. It means focusing on those types of companies that are profitable and that can continue profitability, right? During this period of economic weakness. Remember, we're talking about profit recession. So we want to focus on companies that can maintain profitability. And that really forces us, right, to invest predominantly in the U.S. and in large cap companies. 
Um, there are some other issues with mid and small size companies right now. Number one, um, they're still hiring, which is a great thing. They're trying to make up for lost time. But as they're hiring, they're borrowing, right, to get the capital to hire. Borrowing costs have ballooned, right? Wage pressure on those new hires have ballooned. And so their earnings are getting squeezed very quickly. Again, if we're expecting a profit recession, we want to focus more on large and small in the near term. Um, when it comes to the U.S., right, it's the place that we want to be invested compared to the global markets, just given the elevated levels of risk still, still associated with global markets. It does not mean that the U.S. will outperform global markets this year. It's quite possible that they won't. But when you look at the risks associated with the global markets, they're still extremely high, and the expected return is still fairly modest. So the risk-adjusted return right, is much lower globally than it is in the U.S. right now. And so we favor the U.S. over, glo over global markets. We favor large cap over small cap. Um, on the bond side, you know, it's it's become the new uh, you know the new phenomenon, right? Which is you know for the last decade and a half, nobody wanted to own bonds, nobody wanted to talk about bonds, and you know it's a running joke in the company. I don't think we had more than you know a handful of conversations in the last decade with clients about bonds. A, most people don't understand them, and they were not getting any return from them anyway, so they didn't want to talk about it. Right? It was all about equities. But the world has turned. Right? Last year was a very very ugly year for stocks and bonds, as they all repriced right based upon new Fed policy. When the bond market drops 13%, which is unprecedented, uh, it opens up screaming buying opportunities in the bond world, right? And that's exactly what we've seen. High quality investment grade bonds, right, are yielding, you know, 5% right now on the corporate side, three, three and a half percent on the muni side. So it is a very attractive environment to add fixed income to a portfolio uh, for the first time in a really long time. Not only have we been adding fixed income, but we've also been reducing the more aggressive fixed income in the portfolio because we don't need to reach for yield as much any longer. We can get it by improving the quality. So just like we're improving the quality of our equity holdings, we're doing the same in the bond world. And we're trying to ride out this volatility for a period of time, but make sure we still participate should there be another run on the markets. Let me stop there. In this period of time when rates are higher for bonds, what are your thoughts on using individual bonds versus municipal or uh, corporate bond mutual funds? Um, I think in any scenario, uh, people would prefer to own the individual holding itself rather than some pooled vehicle. We would agree with that. Um, we like to be a little bit more hands-on. We have more control over what we own versus subbing it out to you know a, a fund manager. The other issue that bond funds deal with is the the risk of redemption. People sell bonds, right? People sell out of bond funds. It happened last year. It will happen again if uh, you know rates continue to rise, as an example. We don't want your money to be subject to someone else's decision to liquidate their bond fund, right? But when they liquidate those bond funds, the fund manager gets redemptions. And if the redemption is higher than the cash position held in the fund, they have to sell bonds, and which means they're selling bonds when rates are going up and yield, and prices are falling. So it doesn't allow that bond to recoup the loss by holding it to maturity. That's why we would prefer to own the individual bond if you can. You still have to make sure you look at diversification. You want enough bonds in the portfolio that, God forbid, there was a credit issue or a default, right, that it wouldn't have a meaningful impact in the portfolio. Um, but Ideally, you would want to own the individual bond if possible. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question we, we've been getting is when it you talks about you know not needing to be as aggressive with bonds, but a lot of the bond funds we've been uh, or individual bonds we've been seeing managers add have been more short term in nature. Uh, at what points, if not already, are you starting to look at intermediate or long term bonds? Yeah. Um, also, a good question. So, the the shape of the yield curve, right, really supports uh, adding a lot of short duration bonds to the portfolio, right? The yield curve is inverted, which means you're actually getting paid to be shorter, right? In duration, yields are higher um, because it's a reflection of the Fed's policies versus the inversion on the longer end, which is a reflection of interest rates coming down in the future, right? Uh, as inflation falls and the economy weakens, uh, so. 
the idea of owning short duration makes a whole lot of sense right now. The problem with only holding short duration bonds is what happens when those bonds mature, right? And you know, a lot of investors don't think about the, the reinvestment risk problem of owning bonds, which is those bonds have to be rolled into new bonds. But the Fed, right, is hitting peak re rates, right, within the next couple of months, right? And at some point, as I alluded to in 24, right, they're going to be cutting rates again. So it's quite possible within the next 12 to 18 months, rates are coming down again, right as those short-term bonds right, are maturing. So then what do you do, right? What do you do with that money? Because now you, you have not locked in that long a rate, right? You have proceeds coming off of high yielding bonds, and now you're reinvesting in a much lower interest rate environment. So ideally, what you would want is you would want to take advantage of the yield curve, right, in the shape by buying a chunk on the short end. But also, it's okay to extend duration a little bit to lock in some of those yields, right? Let's lock it in now, even if we're not getting as high of a yield on the long end as we are on the short end, but we know those yields are still elevated compared to where they've been historically, right? So we don't have to worry about the cuts having an impact on the reinvestment uh, risk of the bond portfolio. So think of it, most people think of a ladder, right? That's the, the common term that you know bond managers use, ladder, they buy a little bit out, a little bit out, a little bit out, right? It looks like a ladder in steps. I would think of it more like a barbell, right? Buy the short, buy a little bit of the long to lock in the yields, and they merge and average in right, to a sort of intermediate duration. Okay, wonderful. Uh, one conversation, too, I, I had recently had with a business-owning client who he, he does a lot of business-to-business -business work uh, is he's seen a lot of contracts signed for new business in fourth quarter of last year, and it was people who still had some stimulus money left and were trying to get, take the most advantage of it but then has not seen many new contracts signed in multiple industries since. And so there's some question, is there going to be some sort of abrupt stopping to business spending, right? Everyone's already spent it. They haven't renewed. And all of a sudden those contracts are done. Are we going to see some sort of significant drop off in uh, business spending? And so I'm not sure if that's something you guys have seen. Yeah. Um, it would make sense as the economy weakens uh, that, you know, the again, business ex expenditures would fall. Um, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. I don't think it's going to be an avalanche, right, of, of declines, um, but it should dry up to some extent. Again, the more businesses are spending and expanding, right, the more the Fed is going to have to raise rates to offset it, um, right? So the Fed is going to continue to do so if they continue to see the different elements of the economy be resilient. So my guess is you know, the longer co companies can stay resilient, the more likely the Fed is going to raise rates even higher to end right that inflationary pressure. Um, so I think it's possible that that will happen. I think it's also depends on the industry and the company as well, right? So there there are some companies that you know are, are you know still beefing up and hiring and expanding, and there's others that are you know trying to cut. I think when it's all said and done, there will be more cuts than expansion going forward. There is a lag effect of that. Again, as the U.S. economy falls into recession, all the elements are going to fall into a recession to some extent, right? Consumer spending being one of them, business investment being two of those, two of them. Um, so I, I would I would prepare for something like that. I think it also depends on you know the capital that's outstanding, right? The borrowing costs, right? For you know for those expenditures. Right. I mean, you could I mean, money was so darn cheap for so long that you couldn't go wrong. Right. By borrowing um, yeah. anything you bought, anything project you took on, uh, even if the margins were slim, were still probably had a positive you know, net present value to it. Now, you know, people or companies have to rethink. Right. Uh, you know what? You know, how much are they willing to pay in interest and what does the project look like? And you know, how much does it benefit the company? Right. How much of a hit am I going to take to profits to, you know, to, to make that investment? Um, so it's a little bit more challenging of an environment. And again, it's it's what the Fed is intending to happen. Wonderful. Okay. And um, just one of my last questions, because I know you had referenced that Rockdale is one of the things you've, you've been doing and that you're continuing to do as we go forward in this economy is shift towards just defensive companies, right? Keep some stock because you don't want to take risk off the table when reward is possible. 
but um, shifting more towards just quality companies. And I know that's really been your staple for the last several years, but, um, you know, are there companies you're finding that have been oversold, you know, taking advantage of the big tech sell off and such uh, that has Brockdale been looking into buying some of those companies? As a whole, right, the stock market is not cheap, right? You would assume that after such a bad year, right, where stocks were down 20% on average last year, growth stocks were down in the 30s, right, that all of a sudden everything would get cheaper. Um, but it's a reflection of, you know, future earnings and where we were, uh, you know, pre, right, pre sell-off. Um, so again, um, with this pullback that we've that we saw in 22 with this recovery that we saw in January and this give back in February, the S&P as a whole is trading at like 19 times forward looking earnings, right? Which is still fairly expensive. There are individual components of that that may be a little bit cheaper, um, but there's nothing that's really a screaming buy at the moment. Um, and so it a lot of it also depends on, right? Soft landing versus hard landing, high rates versus low rates. Uh, and a lot of that, you know, will impact the imp the, the dollar and earnings. And so, um, for the growth narrative, right, to begin to to take off again, like we saw in January, right, interest rates have to come down. The dollar has to weaken, right? That that makes total sense, right? When does that happen? Well, it happened in January. We're giving it back so far in February. Um, I don't think that happens where really growth takes off until the, until the market starts pricing in 24, when that, that scenario will play out. Um, so, you know, you still, you know, when you look at the different growth markets, you know, tech tends to be the growth market that most people focus on. And I think that's right. Um, there's a difference between, you know, profitable companies and non-profitable companies. So, you know, a lot of the tech companies, which are extremely profitable, the most profitable in the world, right, are still going to maintain strong profits during this period of time, right? They're not going to see, the extravagant profits, you know, 40 and 50% profit growth like they did, but they could still see low double digits. I think that's possible. Um, stocks are still not cheap in that area, but if they were to get cheaper, that would certainly be an area that we would add to. Um, we're still maintaining our position in tech right now as a whole. The, you know, to, to be a little bit more defensive, um, you know, we've added to healthcare names, which tend to have a defensive element to it. We've added to staples, uh, which have a defensive element to it. Um, even a few utilities, uh, same exact thing. So uh, we have, we're sort of playing both sides of the aisle. We want to be a little bit more defensive, but again, as you mentioned, right, we still have that growth sleeve, if you will, as part of the strategy that will benefit if and when the Fed does cut rates. Excellent. And as I said, that was some of the last of my questions, but uh, we do have a few in the chat here. Uh, specifically, what is the impact on the market if China's involvement the war in Ukraine increases, and also what will that impact be on big ticket items, kind of like what we saw during COVID, um, you know, how that impacted yeah. the market. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, any escalation in, in the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which is, includes involvement of other countries, including the majors like China or, or even, you know, the U.S. to some extent uh, with boots in the ground, would be the exogenous risk that nobody wants. Um, and... I think that's a scenario that, you know, we find ourselves in a deep recession. I think that's uh, obviously there's, you know, an element of globalization that will fall apart under that scenario. Um, those tensions are high, right? They they need to subside. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest risks why we're staying out of the global markets right now is some of the uncertainty surrounding China and what their next move is. Uh, on the China side, you know, they're Last year was all about the you know the zero COVID policies and the damage that they did to the economy. And then in 21, it was all about their you know regulation of the property sector and the tech sector. So they've had you know different issues that have you know, been sort of self-induced. Um, this is a concerning one. I don't know how you price it in, right? Other than saying that if if it escalates, that's the that's the event that I think everybody is concerned about. And I think unfortunately too, it's one of those where we've talked with clients where. You know, that we have much, uh, th there's going to be bigger issues uh, coming around than, uh, you know, what's the portfolio. And obviously that's important. That's what we're looking at. That's what we do. That's what Adam does. Um, but, I, you know, I think we'll start to see it hit a lot of different areas in our lives if, uh, if it becomes an issue with China being involved uh, in the war. Uh, but as Adam said, you know, for that reason, for the war itself that is happening, um, there has not been a lot of exposure to international markets in Rockdale portfolios. 
Um, so I think with that, then uh, we'll leave it there. I don't see any other questions. And, you know, our goal was to keep this relatively short. Um, oh, I'm being notified that there's another question here. Um, so house availability is still low. One third of buyers are paying cash for houses, keeping certain houses high, especially inflated or new homes. We saw this in Florida and even New Hampshire. How long can this cut off? I'm assuming how long could this last? And, and um, I would expand that out and say, um, oh, they're still still writing. <laughs> so we'll, we'll wait a moment. But um, whatever that, that question comes back with, also like to see, you know, what, what impact you see that having on um, the economy as a whole, you know, just people's inability to buy houses. Yeah. The housing market, you know, housing as a whole, let me say, you know, used to be a much larger component of the economy than it is now. Um, so it's all the elements. It's not just the, the purchase of the home, right? It's it's the furnishing of the home. It's the HVAC systems in the home. It's all the jobs that it creates for the building of the homes. Um, so, you know, all that obviously, you know, plays a role in the economy. And, ha and when it's positive, obviously, has a positive impact. Again, not as big of an impact as it, as it once did. Um, there, there is a shortage, right? I mean, again, that uh, we we all know the stories, right? There is a shortage of supply for many different reasons, right? Part of it has to do with lack of building, right? Since the the global financial crisis, as you know, a lot of builders went out of business. Um, there's a immigration issue, right? Which is you know a lot of workers uh, and and trying to find those workers that you know tend to be you know part of those building teams. Um, obviously, at this point, rates play a role into that as well. There was supply chain issues in terms of material costs, right? Labor, again, falls into that as well. Um, and so you had this phenomenon where, you know, there was this huge migration of people, right, from cities and metropolitan areas, right, outside to, to move to other locations. A, they didn't want to be in the city. They wanted, you know, larger houses. Uh, they needed offices. They needed, you know, they were able to move freely and, you know, and work, for, you know, work from home. Uh, and that, you know, changed the dynamic of the market for a period of time. Um, you know, those that were selling obviously sold at very high rates. Those that were buying paid at, you know, very high prices, but but locked in very, very cheap, uh, you know, uh, overall, you know, borrowing costs, right? Mortgage rates were, you know, sub three for a period of time for a 30 rate, 30 year fixed. Uh, so, People that, you know, people that have moved um, are obviously locked into their homes for a period of time, most likely. Now you have a, the other issue, which is as people are thinking about putting their house back on the market, right, to sell, the, the question is, well, where are they moving? If they're able to pay cash for a home, that changes, right, the decision whether they want to move or not. If they have to create, you know, uh, you know take on another mortgage, well, they're giving off, you know, or giving away a very low rate for something much higher, which disincentivizes people from putting their house in the market as well. So that reduces the overall supply as well. And the demand is a function of population. The demand is also a function of rates, right? So over time, if rates remain elevated, right, it's going to price out certain, you know, uh, certain buyers from the market, I would say. So what happens with the housing market? I don't think it implodes by any by any means. I don't think prices get slashed either. Um, there is a chance that you start to see lower bidding wars. And again, rents are coming down, which is a positive thing for inflation, but it also means that there are certain individuals who would think about purchasing a home when rents are high that may do just the opposite, right? Decide to rent longer rather than purchase a home while the prices are high. Uh, so I don't think we're ever going to be in balance in terms of the demand and supply right now. The supply just can't get built fast enough. Um, but the pricing pressure should start to subside. That doesn't mean home prices fall. It just means that they rise at a much lower uh, percentage year over year. Interesting. And uh, you know, one thing I'll add to that, too, is I was reading an article the other day, I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, that was talking about how there's also a, a segment, right? Everyone's jokes about it, but a segment of the millennial generation that's moved back home. Um, and so all of a sudden, instead of $2,000 a month in rent or more, they're spending that on other things. They have the money, uh, they're living at home, their expenses are low. And so you are starting to see this subsection of luxury items uh, do very well. 
Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things is right, one of the richest men in the world is the owner of Louis Vuitton and all the luxury brands that they own. Uh, so it, it's had an interesting impact on other areas of the economy and the market. And I know in New Hampshire, too, one of the problems isn't just the number of homes available, but a lot of the new builds, which I think is, is slightly referenced here, too, have been, you know, more of the, the 700,000 plus homes rather than some of these newer homes that people are, are you know, their first home uh, or, or else their downsized home, which tend to be the, the more popular options that people are trying to get into. So even with building, um, it's really not helping the supply of those homes that are most in demand. Again, the, the first home or the retirement home, which look very similar. <laughs> yeah, I, I think builders have prioritized, right? I mean, without a doubt, right? With all the their costs going up, they've focused on higher ticket, right? Uh, items or higher ticket homes, multifamily units, right? Uh, things that are in demand uh, that, you know, are profitable for them. And as always, someone or some group you know, gets left behind. Uh, that in this case tends to be the first time home buyer, right? Because that is an underbuilt portion, right, of the housing market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question we did receive during that time was, will the election have an impact on the economy? And what do you foresee that impact being? So I know that we're, uh, we're a little far out, right, uh, from that, but it also, you know, this previous the election we just had, right? Has there been things you're starting to see play out? Uh, you know, I think the the common theme that most people are focused on is just the divide in Congress, which, you know, to some extent could be a positive, right? Uh, the checks and balances, if you will, limited spending, things like that. Uh, the negative is that you run into the need to compromise to some extent on things like the debt ceiling, right? Which, you know, becomes a larger issue that we didn't, you know, spend a lot of time talking about on this webinar, but it is, certainly a concern uh, and, you know, will continue to be a larger concern the longer it goes. Uh, so in terms of the 2024 election, um, you know, it, it really depends on the outcome, right? I, you know, I haven't even seen the candidates. What is there one or two right now on the Republican side? Um, uh, Trump and Nikki Haley, right? So um, I'm assuming DeS uh, DeSantis will be part of that and who knows how many other Republicans and Democrats. So Correct. I think it depends, right? It depends on, you know, the outcome of, of obviously that election and, and what Congress looks like at that point in time as well. Um, I always think divided Congress is a positive thing for the economy uh, because of the checks and balances. Uh, what it, you know, you look at, you know, first year versus second year versus third year of, uh, you know, president, presidential cycle and what that technically means for the markets. You know, there. Uh, you know, I think that's you know somewhat of an anomaly, if anything else, right? You can you know point to any any one you know of the four years and say, well, this is a good year for this one versus this one. Um, I think the third year tends to be the best of all, right? That would be this year. So we'll see what happens in the markets if it turns out to be a positive year. So I think it's too early to to be concerned with that right now. I think the number one concern with regards to Congress is is passing the or increase in the debt ceiling at this point in time and as many people may be frustrated by the level of national debt that we have uh this is payments that we've already made right or or money that we've already spent that we now have to pay uh it's an absolute necessity uh, outside of of paying those debts and a default would be catastrophic forget about china entering the war right this would be a catastrophic event uh for the u.s economy defaulting on outstanding debt and what that would mean for the use of the dollar um, as the world's reserve currency, our ability to print money when needed, so many things would fall into that category. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I, I believe then those, those are the questions. There's another comment, but it, it's referencing um, the inflated prices in 55 plus communities, um, which I've <laughs> talked to a lot of clients and the buy-ins alone are uh, just extraordinary. <laughs> um, Again, hence the reason that the supply is not hitting the market. Right. Um, so who, you're not giving up your home right now to to pay an elevated price with an elevated mortgage. Um, it, it, you know, it exacerbates the problem right now. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Adam, uh, very much for taking the time tonight to give this webinar. As I said, um, you've had some great predictions that have borne out uh, both uh, a while ago and, and very recently. So I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to hear what you're seeing in the market what and what you're doing in uh, many of their portfolios. 
Um, this webinar is recorded, so we covered a lot of ground. So if you'd like to go back, you can view it on our website. It'll be up there in a couple of days. We also have on there, we've done two uh, non investment related webinars. We did one on estate planning and end of life planning and another one on cybersecurity. So those recordings are both on the website as well. And then as Adam had briefly alluded to, one of the one thing that is on a lot of people's minds, uh, it has been the debt ceiling and whether that's just because that's a sensational event in the news. So we'll have another webinar uh, coming up soon as well. Um, that is going to touch on that. That one should be 30 minutes. Uh, it's going to be short, similar to this. Um, that's very specific talking about, to, as Adam had said, it's a catastrophic event, but it's one that we've faced, uh, I believe it was about 40 times or so. And every time we've raised that debt ceiling. So, and we've had a few years, we've raised it multiple times. Um, so just talking about what, what things to look at for that. Uh, so please keep an eye out and we'll have that information on our website. If you do have any other questions for Adam after this, uh, please feel free to send me an email or a call and I'll pass them on um, or we can schedule something one-on-one -on -one with Adam. Uh, so thank you everyone for taking the time tonight and Adam, thank you again. And uh, I will let you all go. So have a good night, everyone. Stay warm. Good night. Thanks, James.